Erev Tov, Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benuni. You're watching Israeli News Live. We got a lot of news has been going on here in the last couple of days. A lot of tensions with Russia, the United States, especially up in the Baltic Sea there. Uh, the Russians actually very much provocative themselves and flying only 30 feet away from uh, the... Uh, uh, from one of the American destroyers there that's in the region there uh, doing exercises with Poland. In fact, they had to call off the exercises because of uh, quite, a, quite a while that the Russian uh, bombers, SU-24s and others, were flying so close to the ship there. And, uh, of course, there again, I can understand with Russia as well, they're pretty much uh, getting fed up with all these exercises being done on, uh, on or near their border. Uh, very much uh, using uh, war simulations, uh, c claiming that Russia is their greatest threat. So this may be uh, tit for tat, so to speak there, but it is provocative nonetheless as well for Russia to, to get involved in that. Uh, and, and like I said, just many things are going on. And also Israel is being accused of... Um, of, uh, of war basically is uh, being overly aggressive by the United States with their actions uh, regarding the Palestinians. They've played down uh, the role of the Palestinian terror intifada that is going on right now. Uh, and the U.S. just blaming uh, the Israeli army of uh, excessive force uh, and uh, very, very touchy situation, but in all the different news that is taking place in the Middle East and in other regions of the world, uh, American politics, everything that's going on there, there was an article that was shared with me by Brother Kellen, who just sent this to me the other day there, uh, in regards to uh, another uh, huge event going on in the United States. It was the Azusa Street 110th Annual Revival there, over 100,000 participants there, uh, and ironically, in a very sad twist of uh, circumstances there, we find uh, the, these men, both on the Protestant side and on the Catholic side, bowing down and kissing one another's feet as what they consider to be reconciliation. So we've looked at this message this evening as recon reconciliation takes another huge leap in the year of mercy, the year of mercy that Pope Francis has started there. Uh, and I wanted to bring this out. Lou Engel was, uh, or as the man you see pictured here, bowing down, kissing the feet of a man, a Catholic man there that was appointed by Pope Benedict to unite the Christian, uh, or excuse me, unite the, uh, the evangelical and uh, the, the different faiths together. He's one of the one, of course, Pope Francis, we know, uh, uh, brought in Tony Palmer. As well, which we'll be looking at both of these men uh, this evening that are involved in this. But uh, I, I don't know Lou Engel very much. I'm not here to condemn him, but I do not. Uh, I just have to question why anyone would bow down and kiss the feet of anybody. Uh, it's just really absurd. Uh, anyway, the title of the article on Christian News that came out on April 10th of 2016, Lou Engel of the Call uh, Kneels uh, Kisses Foot of Catholic Leader as an Act of Reconciliation. Let me go into the news on this first, and then we're going to look at this from a biblical aspect uh, of what reconciliation really is. What's it about? Because uh, this is something that's really being played up as part of the Year of Mercy. Uh, Pope Francis does. They're, they're bringing this out as reconciliation. Uh, but the true reconciliation has nothing to do with the Catholic Church. In fact, if anything, this is part of a uh, coming home of uh, the mother church there of uh, Revelation where it speaks of the great whore, Mystery Babylon, and her harlot daughters, and they do return home. That's what you're seeing here. Anyway, one segment of the event featured uh, Mate uh, Matteo Cali Calisi, a Roman Catholic leader who had been appointed by Pope Benedict to serve on the Pontifical Council for the Laity and had also served as the president of the Catholic Fraternity of Charismatic Covenant Communities and Fellowships, Khaleesi, founded United in Christ, an organization that strives for ecumenism between Christians and Catholics. Uh, during the segment at Azusa Now, Khaleesi told the audience that division between Christians and Catholics is diabolical sin, and that Jesus doesn't care that Christians and Catholics disagree on biblical doctrine. Well, you know, in part, I might agree with that because uh, I don't think he's so much worried about all these different biblical doctrines they got there. He wants people back to his word, the very word of God that he established originally 
going back as, as all the way back to Moses, in fact, and that's what we're going to look at in a little bit. So he's not much worried about the different Christian doctrines that they have. You have all kinds of apologetics and everything else to make excuses, uh, so to speak. So, uh, but, but this is definitely not a way to reconcile. And let me just share with you some other things here. Uh, still the same article says Los Angeles Luingo of the call is again raising concerns after a Roman Catholic leader prostrated at his feet because the Catholic leader does this as well and then he returns the favor uh, in declaring that he wanted to kiss his feet in an act of reconciliation between Christians and Catholics and Ingle returned the act by likewise kissing the man's shoes. But they had a very interesting uh, uh, comment that was made in regards to what happened uh, I don't know the man's name, but they, they quote him here in the article. It says, what's up with Lou Engel? Letting the representatives of the Catholic Church kiss his feet because it would logistically be impossible to wash his feet. Of course, that was what was written in the article as well. He said he would like to wash his feet, which that would be okay. It is biblical. Foot washing is biblical, but not kissing the feet. Anyway, wrote one man from Brazil. He said, I seem to remember John falling at the feet of an angel. And the angel freaked out. He yanked, yanked John up onto his feet, admonished him for doing so. Worship God was the charge set forth by this angelic being who understands the kingdom of heaven, or in this case, kingdom order. We don't bow down to anyone's feet or kiss anybody's feet. Uh, but that's something a lot of people do. They go to the Pope of Rome, they bow before him and everything else. But this is not what God has called us to do. Uh, anyway, though, as I was looking at this, though, in the article that Brother Kellen sent me there, it reminded me of Tony Palmer, the bishop, the Lutheran bishop there that was a very close friend of not only Kenneth Copeland, but as well with uh, Pope Francis when he was uh, Borgilio uh, beforehand down in Brazil. Uh, this was uh, on the uh, website uh, Call Me George, July 11th of 2014. It said, earlier this year, Francis called his old friend, Bishop Tony Palmer, and invited him to visit him at the Vatican. While there, Tony asked Francis if he would send a message to a group of evangelicals he was soon to meet. Francis suggested a video, and they proceeded to make a cell phone video. Tony had subtitles added to this video and presented it at a conference held by Kenneth Copeland. If you haven't seen the videos, they are worth one, uh, one time as they demonstrate what Francis means by Catholic and how evangelicals perceive Francis and his Novus Ordo Church. If one doesn't have the time to watch the videos, at least watch the third video below Francis' cell phone video message about unity. And as far as the unity message, outwardly it does sound interesting. And of course, Tony Palmer talks about how that when he met the Pope there and uh, that the Pope said he didn't call him for any agenda. But then they began to talk about him going to meet Kenneth Copeland at the big meeting that was coming up with all the different leaders that would be around. You might want to listen to this just for a moment, especially in this particular part of the interview where he's at uh, Kenneth Copeland's uh, retreat there speaking about what he was saying to Pope Francis. In light of these were the big guys, the big fish. Listen to what he has to say here. That's a father. That's a mentor. So I started to tell him, you know, I said, I can't believe I'm sitting here. I said, you know how much we can do together? Yes. And we made a covenant to work for unity for the church. And I said, listen, next week, I am going to Kenneth Copeland Ministries Ministers Conference. And I told him about you. I told him all your crazy stories. <laughs> I said, there's going to be thousands of leaders and these guys have their jets. They've got TV shows. And I said, they've got churches of 10,000, 2,000, 20,000. I said, these are big fishes. <laughs> so he said, so what do you want to do? I said, well, can you please? I told him that about Kenneth and Gloria's partnership with us from day one. And uh, you know, I, lot, I lost a lot well, of the After that particular big fish meeting, some of those big fish there ended up going to the Vatican getting a personal audience with Pope Francis. So I guess after all it was successful in bringing the first evangelical leaders back together, back to the mother church. As Tony Palmer uh, said to the congregation there when he was speaking, the Lutherans and uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, there was, uh, let's see, Lutherans and I think it was Episcopalians had already came back in and reconciled their differences with the Catholic Church. But then he goes into something that I thought was rather strange. And I actually tried to write down exactly what Tony Palmer said there at the meeting with Kenneth Copeland. And this is what he quotes on the video. He says, I believe God has brought me here this year to the minister's conference in the spirit of Elijah. Let me explain, if you look carefully, the spirit of Elijah was on John the Baptist to turn the hearts of the sons to the fathers, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons, excuse me, to the son, to prepare the way of the Lord. And we know that prophecy always has a double fulfillment, and we know Elijah will come before the second coming as well. And I have understood that Elijah is the spirit of reconciliation, to re return hearts to each other. But, you know, even when I was listening to some of the video, they were using a Spanish translator there on uh, uh, the, the uh, on Bill Ingalls there. Uh, they, they were actually using the same terminology. I actually heard them speaking about coming in the spirit of Elijah for reconciliation. And of course, this has happened long after Tony Palmer's death, uh, or at least... Uh, if it's really true that he did die, from what the news report was, he died in a motorcycle accident. There's been some controversy over that. Won't get into that. But he says that he came in the spirit of reconciliation or the spirit of Elijah, and he understands the Elijah is the spirit of reconciliation. Well, the odd thing is there's some truth to the part, part about this Elijah is for the spirit of reconciliation. But I figured I would break that down for you guys this evening to, to stay in line with God's Word, because that's what's important, is that we're in line with His Word, not just our own imagination. And the only reconciliation that we see that is going on as of right now between the Catholic Church, Protestants, Evangelicals, or whatever more that join back up with the Catholic Church, is they are reconciliating the mother, uh, or Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots there, is reconciling back with her daughters. That's their reconciliation. But it's not the spirit of Elijah that does that. Let's take a look at this. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city. Okay, so notice, the 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Now the angel Gabriel is speaking to Daniel. His people are the Jews. All right, so keep that in mind. Thy holy city, Jerusalem, and, uh, excuse me, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. So there is a reconciliation coming. That's true. Daniel saw it. And to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So let's break this down just a little bit. If we look at Oxford's Dictionary, the action, speaking of uh, defining the word reconciliation, the action of making one view or belief compatible with another. That's what reconciliation really is. It is the action of making one view or belief compatible with another. No wonder why the Catholic Church has Tony Palmer and other Catholic representatives out there saying that they're in the spirit of reconciliation. They're trying to reconcile the differences between the Catholic Church, their doctrine, versus the doctrines of the evangelical community or the Baptists or the Pentecostals, Lutherans, Episcopalians, whatever the case may be. They're trying to make their views or belief compatible with one another. Any possibility of reconciliation between such clearly opposed opposition or positions. That's true. So in that regard there, they are reconciling their difference, but it's not the reconciliation of Elijah. And that's the point we want to get into here. Let's look at one other issue here. The word is see, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Notice the 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Well, the problem is we, we know that Yeshua did come. Yeshua did take and he finished the transgression. He did make an end of sins. But when it comes to making reconciliation for iniquity, has he actually completed that task 2,000 years ago? Some would argue yes. And in fact, in the Mamre Bible online, if you look at that one there, they actually say to forgive iniquity. 
But if you'll notice, they take the Hebrew word and they put it in brackets and they added it to the word of God, but it's right next to the word reconcile. See, you cannot add to God's word. They did that because they failed to recognize what true reconciliation for iniquity is. And then what is iniquity? Well, Bible Study Tools has a pretty good definition for that. Let's look at it. It says in the Old Testament of 11 words translated iniquity, there's 11 words translated this way, by far the most common and important is awan, which is what is used here in Daniel 9.24. Okay, it explains, uh, it's, it's about 215 times uh, etymolog etymologically, it is customary to explain it as the meaning literally crookedness, perverseness, i.e. evil regard as that which is not straight or upright, moral distortion, from Iwa to Ben, make crooked or pervert. Driver, however, following Lagardi, maintains that two roots, distinct in Arabic, have been confused in Hebrew. One equals to Ben or pervert. As above, and the other equals to err or go astray. That a one is derived from the latter and consequently expresses the idea of error, deviation from the right path rather than that of perversion. Doesn't it speak about in the Bible about seeking out the old paths? See, this is what God wants Israel to do, is to go back to that old path. All right, so now it begins to make more sense, the reconciliation for iniquity. So they need to reconcile what? Because there is the error or deviation from the right path. Well, see, when Yeshua came to the earth here, he was trying to get Israel on the right path. But instead, they failed to recognize their Messiah when he came. And they ended up turning him over to the Romans to be crucified. So the reconciliation for iniquity to bring this back, as we can see here, to make one view, uh, one view or belief compatible, the view or the belief that has gone off the path was the doctrine that Israel had. If they hadn't have gone off the path with the doctrine, then we would not have a reconciliation for iniquity issue. God permitted the sacrifices, just like Ezekiel said the same thing in chapter 20. He give them a law, he said, but it wasn't a good one. He give them ordinances. Why? Because they would not, they would not keep his commandments that he gave there at Mount Horeb. So he ended up giving the Levitical law. So he permitted it because the, 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 the Jewish people, they were so caught up in the traditions of the Egyptians that they had to have something. They always had to have something to, to help them out. So God permitted the sacrificial system. But this is what Yeshua was trying to reconcile. He was trying to get Israel back to the true path. All right, now, let's continue on, though. Let's look at this reconciliation that we're talking about. If you go to Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, now this is where Tony Palmer is quoting from when he says he comes in the spirit of Elijah. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. That's what he says, right? Now watch what Yeshua says here in the book of Matthew 17, 10 to 12. His disciples ask him saying, why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Now you have to keep in mind, this is right after the Mount Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah have appeared to Yeshua, which to me has always been a perfect type of the two witnesses because notice it's the two olive trees standing on either side of the golden lampstand. Christ is that golden lampstand standing there with the two olive trees, Moses and Elijah. And then right there in Israel, you have there in, that, in the Garden of Gethsemane there, the two ancient olive trees over 2,000 years old. A true testimony that Moses and Elijah are your two witnesses that will return. All right, but anyway, they ask him the question. They just saw Moses and Elijah, so they're kind of confused about this. So they ask the question, why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Yeshua answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. That's interesting. 
Elijah is going to come and restore all things. But he says, I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. So it's two comings. Well, even Tony says, is it not compound fulfillment? Well, certainly it is. Yeshua clearly says it. And even in the Greek language, when he says, truly, Elias truly shall first come, it is a future tense. But you've got to remember, John the Baptist is already dead. So if John the Baptist was at Elias coming back, and then Yeshua says, he shall first come and restore all things, there's some restoration or reconciliation still to be done. Because in this case here, to restore all things is to bring them back to that pure word of God. Not just, in this case here, that's to bring the Jews back to the pure word of God. And then the Jews bring back the Gentiles. What does the scripture say? They, ten people of the nations will take hold of the skirt of the Jew and say, we hear the Lord is with you, show us your ways. Brother, sister, we're not talking about show us the ways of what they're trying to give you now and go out here with the Temple Institute here on Passover coming up and sacrificing the bull. That God doesn't want you going back out there. That's what he's trying to get. The, he's trying to get Israel to recognize to cease from the sacrificing. Yeshua said, if you knew what this meant, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. Okay, he permitted that. In Levitical law, that was a permitted, a permission given the sacrificial system. Look at many rabbis agree with that. Even Rabbi Tobia Singer says that this was not God's perfect way of redemption. The perfect way was through repentance. Okay, so there has to come a restoration or a reconciliation of iniquity, and that iniquity is where they have gotten off the path, that path of God's word. They have distorted it down through the years. And that, when I say distorted, I'm talking about where the scribes and stuff run around and try to teach, as Yeshua said, you're teaching doctrines, or the, excuse me, the commandments of men for the doctrines of God. And this is what God is against. But anyway, he says, but I say unto you that Elias has come already and they knew him not. All right, now, let's see, we already got that there. Let's move on then. Now, here's what's interesting though. In Malachi 4.4, 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. I always thought that was strange. Why was that thrown into Malachi? Now that's actually right there before verse 5 and 6 where he says he's going to send Elijah. And Elijah is going to what? Elijah is going to, let's back up again, look at it again. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and coming and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. All right? Now, he does the turning of the hearts and everything, but he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now, according to this here, this is the verse right in front of that. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. What is that? Why is that even there then? Well, if you think about the restoration, if you think about reconciliation, there must have been something that Israel was not doing right at the time when Yeshua came. Now, ironically, this happens to be the last verse. If you, look at, if you look at the same Malachi verses, this is the last one and not uh, in the, it was Malachi 4.4 here. In the Septuagint, it's also Malachi 4.4, but Malachi 5, 4, 5, and 6 are above this. And then he brings in the part about Moses' servant, which I commanded in him at Horeb. Uh, I do have that. I'll re Let me just show you how that's worded there. Um, oh, gosh, I may not find it in time here right now. But anyway, that's what he does. He does, he, he, he reads off, uh, behold, I will send my uh, servant, or let me, let me back it up. He, he does it like this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and, uh, great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their, to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And then he reads right into this one. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. That's the way the Septuagint orders this. And the other way around in, in the uh, canon that, we, that we're using today uh, from the Masoretic text. So it's just kind of interesting how that works. Now, going back to Daniel 9, 24, again, notice what it is. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. 
and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. So yes, Moses and Elijah come to make reconciliation of iniquity. Now I cannot help but wonder too if maybe the reason that God puts in here about uh, remember the law of Moses is because Moses is coming with Elijah for the reconciliation of iniquity, getting them back to the uh, the correct path to reconcile that difference that they have there. Now, let's take a look at that reconciliation process. In Zechariah 12, verse 9, going down to verse 14, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. You know, this is, this is interesting in, in itself. This is not necessarily just a battle that they come against Jerusalem, which we know it's going to be a battle as well. We see that in Ezekiel 37, 38, and, and places like that. But this is also in a spiritual warfare right here. I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. They're coming with every doctrine that you can possibly imagine in Israel. God doesn't need all of that, all right? And then what he says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, or thrust through in Hebrew, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now, some people try to say, well, if the Vatican is the one that actually, they drove the nails in his hand, they're the ones that pierced his side as well. I agree with that. And they're guilty as guilty can be as well because of that. All right? But in this case here, God has got to make reconciliation. Now, the reconciliation in this case here, God, he, he, it's, this has nothing to do with the sin. God's are, Yeshua forgave them when he was on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. And I've had people write me and said, well, that wasn't the Jews. That was the, the Romans. Well, if it was the Romans, then why then does God here in Zechariah, did Zechariah the prophet, put this on Israel? Why does he say unto Daniel, the reconciliation is between Israel and God? It's not between Israel. The Romans, it's between Israel, all right? And then we see here that even though they didn't physically put the nails in his hand, they did not physically drive the spear into his side, but then God says here, and the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. We have Levi, we have Shimei. That covers the entire house of Judah. Shimei was a Benjamite. Levi is the tribe of Levi. David and Nathan both were from the tribes of Judah. And so they are the ones that are there recognizing for the first time that they're still responsible. You know, yeah, they passed the buck, as we say, but God is still holding them responsible. Look at Genesis, and we're getting ready to close here. Genesis 44, 15, And Joseph said unto them, What deed is it that you have done, what you not, that such a man as I can certainly divine? See, he wants to know, in other words, what is your sin? What did you do? What's, what have you done that, you know, all these things are coming upon you? Because it looked like all kind of mischief was coming upon him. Now, the funny thing is, Joseph, although he did speak with them, he kept using his servant. He was the go-between. He was the one working, bringing about the reconciliation process. It's just like the two witnesses. The two witnesses will bring about that reconciliation process, pointing out to Israel where you went wrong, what you did wrong. And in the process, I think that's also where the Gentiles, too, will begin to recognize, because they are going to see the two witnesses as well, where you went wrong, where you went off the path. But the reconciliation is for Israel. Okay? Now, watch what he says. And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Wow. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both he and also with whom the cup is found. You know, it was the innocent brother that had the cup. Just like today. The Jews today are innocent. They, the, the Jews today had they, they, they have no part in the crucifixion of Yeshua. They weren't there back then. They, they didn't do it. But yet the whole world wants to blame them. 
for the crucifixion of Yeshua. They didn't drive the nails in his hand. That's true. Neither was Benjamin guilty either, my Jewish brothers, my Jewish sisters. Benjamin was not guilty, but yet the cup was placed in his back. Doesn't that seem unfair for Joseph to do that? Basically condemning an innocent man? But maybe there's a bigger reason behind this sin. According to Genesis 45, 1, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him. I bold that. You know why? Because the two witnesses died. Before Yeshua physically reveals himself to Israel, even like in the vision of Nathan, the young Jewish boy there that uh, had the near-death experience, he talks about right before Messiah splits the, the, uh, the Mount of Olives there. He said there's these two dead guys that raise up. And when they go up, then the mountain splits. Exactly. And there stood no man with him. Two witnesses are dismissed. While Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. So they do their part in bringing about the reconciliation and getting Israel back on that right path. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard, and Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. My, my fellow Christian brothers and sisters, don't be angry with what Israel did. They were sent and they did what they did of God in order to preserve life. The life of the Gentiles, because notice the Egyptians were blessed and their lives were preserved right along with the Jewish believers of that day. So the reconciliation needs to be with Israel. This is what the true reconciliation is. What you see going on with the Catholic Church and the Protestants, the evangelicals, etc., all this that they're doing, this is not true reconciliation. It's reconciling back to their mother, which is not a very good thing in the light of the Scripture, especially in light of the Scripture that God will bring judgment upon Rome. I wouldn't want to reconcile with a church that clearly is going to be found under the judgment of Almighty God. And I'm not against any of the people there. Just like these people that were involved in what happened at Azusa Street, 110th anniversary, bowing down and kissing each other's feet there. You know, I, I don't judge these people. I don't judge Pope Francis or any of these guys. I would, that God, that they all would come to the true knowledge of God and forsake all these other things. And then prayerfully, Wait and wait to see what God will do with Israel in the very coming future. It's not in the spirit of Elijah with these people. Not at all. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, a prophetic segment of our broadcast. Shalom. God bless you.